After a long offseason, we're finally nearing the season opener, Clemson versus Georgia in Atlanta. Uh, and it's been a long time to get here, but Clemson's riding a five-game win streak. Uh, to keep that going, they'll be facing probably the best team in the country. And help me t- help me talk about it and break it down. We have Anthony D- Anthony Dasher joining from UJSports.com. Anthony, thanks for being here. Yeah, my pleasure, Ron. Appreciate you doing this. And I want to start with uh, quarterback, right? The most important mm-hmm. position in football. So let's talk a little bit about Carson Beck. Mm-hmm. Uh, Georgia has not had a quarterback taken in the first three rounds since Stafford went number one back in 2009. Mm-hmm. But last year, Beck threw for 3,941 yards. He had a 24 to 6 TD to interception ratio, and he had a really, really nice uh, 72.4 completion percentage. All really good. He's projected to go top 10 in a lot of mock drafts. All really impressive. So I want to know, you know, Stetson Bennett had 4,000 yards in his final season. Is Beck somewhat of a product of the really incredible coaching talent, just everything around him? Or is he more like, you know, a Drake May, a Jaden Daniels, Bryce Young, CJ CJ Stroud, one of these really elite talents? Because I sense that he sounds like we're the first one of those that George has had since, uh, since Stafford. I think that's probably a good assessment as far as, uh, you know, a quarterback based on a being an NFL prospect, just based on on what he is physically and, and able to do, you know, with the football, you know, in his hands. You know, you know that. So I think to a certain extent, all quarterbacks were a product of their system in one way, you know, you know, shape or form. Obviously, you know, Carson's a very different kind of quarterback than than, than Stetson Bennett was. Uh, Stetson, you know, would do a lot of running around, could improvise. We saw in the exhibition game the other day where the Rams on that fourth down play kind of slung a ball inside him. You won't see Carson Beck do that kind of thing against Clemson, but uh, what he can do is, is stand in the pocket. He can move around you know, a lot better, I think, than people think he can, and he's got a, uh, a host of uh, players, you know, some very good skilled players to, to get the ball to, even though they lost, obviously, someone like Brock Bowers, who's, a, you know, I'm, I'll say he's the best tight end I've personally seen you know, with Georgia in over, in, in over 20 years, but even without Brock, they've got a, uh, a bunch of guys, you know, back, brought in from the transfer portal, and they expect Carson to have another very big year. So in terms of strengths and weaknesses, it sounds like maybe he doesn't have the wheels on him that Bennett did, but some other strengths? Yeah. Well, I, he, I, like I said, he, you, you you flush him out of the pocket, he can't pick up a first down. He's not afraid to run. And they they did a few times run some, uh, uh, you know, some zone read type stuff with him down around the, the red zone. He scored, I think, it was a six or seven touchdowns on the ground. So, I mean, he, it's not something that Clinton can look at and say, oh, this guy's not going to run the football. Somebody will have to keep an eye on him, you know, like just in case he decides to break, uh, you know, contain. But, but again, he's a he's a guy that has a lot of a lot going for him right now. I mean, he wasn't there. There was a, some times last year uh, on the deep ball. He was a little, maybe a little bit inconsistent. I know that's something they've been working on a lot of uh, you know, here during uh, fall camp. Maybe bring that percentage uh, number up there a little bit. But you talk about short range passes, mid range passes. You mentioned the seventy two percent completion percentage. That was a UGA record last year. So. He knows what to do uh, with a football when he gets it. Yeah, the ball, ball doesn't seem to hit the ground a whole lot. So one thing I think Georgia does really, really well is the way they use the portal. A lot of Clemson fans uh, kind of talk about the portal as you can go Clemson or you can go Florida State where mm-hmm. you know you don't really have a team. You just pick buy a team every year. But Georgia, the way they do it, they recruit better than anyone. And then they get a few really big impact guys. Like last year it was Dominic Lovett who came in, had 613 receiving yards. That's more than anyone in Clemson had last year. This year, one of the biggest names, probably the biggest name, was Trevor Etienne coming in from Florida, the running back. ton of hype around him. Uh, all the folks playing the new popular EA Sports video game, he's the greatest player in the history of football in that game. It's outrageous. <laughs> um, but he had a good, but not really special year last year, 753 yards. Good. Again, not special. And then when he got to Georgia in March, he was arrested, and I'm going to read it so I don't say anything wrong sure, here, sure. Drunken, for, uh, drunken driving, failure to maintain lane, improper driving, and affixing materials that reduce visibility through the windows or windshield. Those have been dropped. But uh, two questions. We'll start with just ETN here. Uh, so is he going to be the best running back that, that Georgia's had since like Chubb and Michelle back in 2017? And then how, how good could it be? Well, I don't know about, about that. I mean, DeAndre Swift was pretty good, too, for George after uh, Chubb and Michelle. You know, so both left as well as Amir White's now, uh, you know, starting for the for the Raiders. So, I mean, I, so they've had a bunch of good running backs so, since then. But but uh, what Trevor does bring, I think, that maybe they haven't had maybe since the, the you know, Sony Michelle and Nick Chubb uh, eras as Village 
ability to catch the football out of the backfield, make something happen. Uh, and he had like I think 23 catches last year for Florida, you know, splitting time at running back with Marcus Johnson. And uh, he'll uh, yeah, he, he's gonna be a big weapon, I think. Uh, you know, you know, out of the backfield for Georgia this year, that's gonna be another dynamic to his game. I mean, the question is whether he's gonna play against Clemson. That's the biggest thing that I think everybody kind of wants to know right now. And right now, sitting here, you know, talking to you, I don't know if he is or not. I mean, uh, you mentioned he had the uh, DUI charges uh, uh, were, uh, were 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 pleaded down basically, and he pleaded no contest to uh, to the underage drinking and the uh, the reckless driving. Uh, but we still don't know if that's going to be enough, uh, you know, that along with some of the in-house suspend, in-house stuff they make players do once they get in trouble, if he's going to be available to, to play or not. Personally, i actually not sure that he will. I, mean, I, I think Coach Mark wants to send a message to some of these guys. So if I was to lay, lay, lay my Vegas money down right now, I'd say there's probably a, a 55% chance, 60% chance he does not play in this ball game, which then leads to the next question. Which running back would Georgia have that is disposal, you know, for Clemson? Which again, fortunately for Georgia, they've got some some talented guys, a lot of talent, but a couple of those guys are freshmen, and we don't know exactly how they're going to perform. That's interesting. I think Clemson fans uh, maybe crudely just assume Kirby doesn't care; he's going to play him. So I think it would be uh, obviously great as a Clemson fan and wants to increase their odds of winning, but also to probably send that important message. And that's a good segue because I do want to ask about sort of the off-season troubles. Mm-hmm. Um, opposing fan bases have been kind of quick to highlight their belief, right or wrong, that Kirby Smart is kind of a win-at-all-costs coach. Um, like I said, you know, it seems like charges get dropped or pleaded down, whatever the case may be, like they did with ETN. And then related, but, you know, not against the law per se, uh, there was a graphic that was all over X not too long ago where Georgia had the worst graduation rate in all the P4 at only 41%. Did all that, I mean, obviously, I'm sure – you're not thrilled about that. Mm-hmm. That's that's fine. But I'm curious, is there any chance at all that are they losing their focus? It takes such incredible focus to win. Does that bleed onto the field? Or is is this Georgia program kind of becoming like bad boy Florida State, bad boy Miami, you know, uh, Meyer, Florida, where they're just so good it, it doesn't matter? Or is there something else and I'm, I'm giving too unfair sort of – Well, a um, um, couple things, first of all. One, one – uh, Kirby Smart does not like the fact his players are getting pop for speeding. I mean, most of these uh, offenses have been been driving deals, reckless driving. Uh, you know, there's been a couple of DUIs you mentioned, but hasn't been it, it, to be honest with you, there's probably more DUIs than Mark Rick was the head coach than there has been since you know yeah. Kirby Smart has become the head coach. So I don't know. Mm-hmm. It, it's, it's not a deal. I think Kirby says it does not have a rules in place or does not want uh, and doesn't care if his players, you know, break the law or whatnot. That's absolutely not true. They will bring in speakers. They will bring in policemen. They have everybody and his brother who could possibly talk to a team about staying out of trouble has been to Athens, I mean, on a weekly basis. Kids just have to start, you know, taking account for themselves. Bottom line, I mean, people and that's a lot of people want to, want to blame the police. They won't blame somebody for some of the stuff that's going on. Ultimately, this is just my opinion. I mean, these, I mean, I know these guys are 18, 19, 20, 21 year old, you know, players, but sometimes you got to hold yourself accountable. And I can't, I kind of answer what Coach Moore is trying to finally get these guys to do. Now, like you said, there's been a lot of criticism over for Coach Smart over this thing. He doesn't care and then doesn't, uh, you know, he should be doing this and that. You know, I have done some research on some other programs who have gotten kids, you know, in trouble for, for driving, uh, and, you know, incidents. And, and I'll, I'll be honest, I'm not just saying this because I, I write for Georgia or whatnot, but very few teams kick players off for driving offenses. I, mean, sure. I can't, yeah. I can't think of a, a many at all. Cause I say, you know, whoever, you know, got a speeding ticket, you know, you know, with rest with, with 25 over speed limit, had that an invalid license. I don't, you know, whatever. I, I, I can't recall anybody getting kicked off the team for something like that, but coach has kicked off. That's, that's a misnomer too. Coach has kicked off players for different, you know, violations. We saw that with Ra Ra Thomas, the, the sad situation he was involved in couple of weeks ago when he was a uh, you know it was uh, something a lot more serious than uh than sure. uh, you know than, than uh, you know going 85 miles per hour on the interstate uh so they they take i think georgia does you know they do take take care they, they try to keep this thing from happening it's just ultimately these kids have to start taking account for themselves i think that's the biggest thing right now the coach is trying to get them to understand that hey you can't do this and when you do there's going to be consequences yeah, and you know what? In fairness, a few years ago, Clemson had a guy, Fred Davis, a cornerback, and, and he was racing and got in a car accident and hurt somebody really bad. 
Uh, and, and he wasn't old, immediately kicked off the team either. So, you know, in all fairness, Clemson fans. And this, and this is what Robbins, you know, everybody remembers the tragedy in Athens in January two years ago when Devin mm-hmm. Willett was killed. One of the staffers, Courtney LaCroix, was killed in the same accident. And these things continue to happen since that incident occurred. And that's probably the probably the most, you know, if you're just if you're just, a, just a person, that's probably the most disappointing thing. That's, that's out there. These things keep continuing, having kids keep taking chances like this. You know, and again, I don't know if because of the NIL, everybody's got a fast car now. I was and, just going to uh, say you know, that. You know, you're 18 yeah. and you get a $100,000 car. I saw Carson, I, he, Carson Headbeck has not gotten in trouble, so I'm not implying that. But I saw yeah. he got, I don't know, was a, a Lamborghini or Ferrari or yeah, something? He's, he's, he's leasing a Lamborghini, yeah. Yeah, okay. He's going so. he to actually buy it, but he's leasing it. So, you know. Yeah, so <laughs> it, it's a situation sure probably not the best for an 18 year old. Yeah. All right. Let's let's talk some football. Um, yeah. An area where Clemson's uh, struggled might be a slight over overstatement, but I'll say struggled at least a little more than a blue blood program should, or, or maybe other blue blue bloods do, is on the offensive line. Now, they finally broke rank, hired a non Clemson guy, brought in Matt Luke, but he fits the culture. I've listened to uh, a podcast that David Pollock does that he was on, so I, I was pretty well aware of him both. Mm-hmm sort of how his how he lives his life off the field as well as his success on the field. Uh, and I know that he was at Georgia, obviously, while you were while you were covering the Bulldogs. Just your thoughts on that hire and Matt Luke in general. I've always been been pretty impressed with Matt Luke. I know he's an outstanding recruiter. I mean, he's the one that uh, convinced uh, Marius Mims to, to sign with Georgia. You know, a few years ago, Marius went to in the first round of the NFL draft this year. So he's an right. excellent recruiter. Kids really relate to him very well. I know he's a uh, – he, he, you know, he, didn't have so much luck as the, as the head coach at Ole Miss, but the players there always respected him, and 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 uh, he took a, he had a, he re, you know replaced Sam Pittman in, in, in Athens, which wasn't easy to do. Coach Pittman was beloved, but yeah. uh, but uh, but you know but Matt I thought did a did a great job of you know fitting in, and uh, really uh, you know players really took to him you know very quickly. And his offensive line I thought always you know played pretty well. So I know I think he got the kind of personality personality that probably probably fits pretty meshed pretty well with Dabo. And I can certainly see why he would want to, you know, to bring him on. And, you know, again, for me now looking on from the outside in, some of the players he's starting to bring into Clemson, I think he's starting to do some of the same type of things he did at Georgia. So at Georgia when he came, he was replacing Sam Pittman. So the offensive line was pretty elite. Yeah. He's got a pretty good lineage there. Mm-hmm. A little bit of a different situation. Not that Clemson was horrible, but they weren't great on the offensive line last year. They don't have a great track record of putting a bunch of first-rounders in uh, from the offensive line. How long – I mean, is this something where they could see a decent jump from an offseason of coaching, or is this a four-year thing before he could make a big impact? Yeah, I think just how quickly you can get somebody's top uh, top line to come come to your school. It's, it's all about the Jimmy and Joe. People ask me all the time, what's the secret to Georgia's success? I don't think it's necessarily Kirby Smart's this outstanding, great, you know, invented football type coach, but he's bringing in these players who are just some of the best in the country, and ultimately that's what it takes. And, I, and Coach Luke, again, has had a – He's had a history of bringing these type of players, so I think that should that along by itself should should be a, I think exciting for Clint's fans, fans knowing he has done it other places before, and and he's got all the resources that you know uh, up in Clemson to do the same thing. Yeah, you know Clemson's offensive line is packed full of four stars. They got a five star left tackle, but they haven't lived up to those expectations yet. So now, you know when I think of Georgia and what they're great at, and it's kind of a lot of things, but the main thing I think of is in the trenches. So mm-hmm. how do you assess this matchup between Clemson's veteran, but you know, not super successful last year offensive line. They bring four guys back and add Matt Luke versus Georgia's D line. Is that something where Clemson can at least hang, or is that going to be a big uh, mismatch? Uh, Georgia defensive line, they've got some solid players. They've got some players who have got a, some, a lot of good SEC experience. There's no Jalen Carter. There's no Jordan Davis. Guys who I consider big disruptors, big havoc makers you know, up front. But they are guys who know how to how to how to hold space. They don't give up, uh, you know, many big plays. Uh, and uh, they they allow the linebackers to come up and you know and, and do their job, which I think is ultimately what Georgia wants this off this defensive line rather, you know, to do this year. On the flip side, I think that's going to be the, that's going to be the battle to watch. Now the Clemson defensive line is is really good, and Georgia's offensive front it could. Again, could be one of the best they've had since Kirby has been there, which is you know kind of saying saying a lot. But uh, no doubt, the, the trenches is always where these kind of games are won, and uh, I think both teams, uh, no, I won't say advantage. Don't both teams have advantage, but both teams I think are very solid. At least one in one or two areas of that of that of that front line. And that's going to be what the I think going to ultimately win this ball game. Yeah, I think if Klubnik has made the improvements that 
you know, they always say in the offseason, yeah, of course, yeah. is the, you, a thousand times better than he was. But if so, then let's see how this this line line play is. Sounds like you think uh, Clemson's offensive line could at least hold up long enough to give him a chance. Is that is that fair? Uh, we'll see. Georgia is just, just kind of doing little things different on the defense as far as a couple of players go, which is going to make it interesting, I think. Uh, Michael Williams, who I'm sure you're familiar with, a defensive man. They've got him in a – Kind of, kind of as a hybrid outside linebacker right now. They want, want him to be able to, to take his hand out of the dirt, play the stand-up edge rusher, and that's something that George they did a good job last year with their pass rush. But they think they could do a lot better. You know, they think you know standing Mike L up, he's going to be able to maybe create a little more havoc. The same thing with a uh, you know inside linebacker Jalen Walker from North Carolina. He's another guy who uh, they on, on third down passing situations they want to bring him. They're going to bring him up to the line of scrimmage as a, as a stand-up pass rusher. So. Uh, I think those two guys are going to be key, and, and as far as as far as you know, containing the quarterback, uh, you know, Clemson, at, at, at Clemson coming up in this ball game. But if they can't, then he's going to have a chance to run around and make some plays. Yeah, and you know, for, for Clemson, I think uh, last year, look at Jake Brings to a big time tight end, good pass catcher. He was not a good blocker, and he's added some weight. I think I think that's going to be key. Phil Moffa is kind of the star running back. Great, great runner. Really, really good runner. Mm-hmm. Uh, decent pass catcher too. Was not good in pass pro. I think that's a, 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 the place for him to grow. If both of that, those guys can improve there, I think that's huge for Clemson. So uh, looking at Georgia, and then we'll kind of talk about this game just a little bit more, but Georgia big picture, their schedule is brutal. It feels like last yeah. couple of years they've caught some breaks by the SEC schedulers, but not this year going to Alabama, mm-hmm. going to Texas. I think it's two Ole Miss, mm-hmm. uh, neutral side against Clemson. I mean, that is a ridiculous foursome. Um, I saw the over-unders around 10 and a half. Um, I think they'll make the playoffs, but – uh, is, is staying ten wins is that um, is that negative? I think, is that too low to say they go ten and two? Yeah, that's quite possible. Like you said, I've got to go to Alabama. I mean, that's going to be one to uh, to watch. I think uh, in the back of Georgia mind, even though they you know they beat the Tide for the national title a couple years ago, and you know Alabama won the SEC championship game last year. So and maybe that's still a little little tiny little piece of doubt for Georgia about how they can consistently play with Alabama. But I think obviously with the, everything that's going on. It, in Tuscaloosa now, with uh, you know Nick Saban no longer there, they think they've got a little better chance. But that game in Texas is the one I think that everybody and that one Athens is really excited about going off to Austin. You know, for the first time, uh, you know Texas. A lot of people think they may have a, a great chance of winning the national title, and I think they 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 do. I mean, that's another team you you're going to see in the in the playoffs. I think uh, for sure they almost won it won it last year. Of course, now they've got some running back issues going on. Their two top running backs have gotten hurt and are out for the year. So that, that probably favors Georgia, you know, just a little bit. But no doubt the schedule. We didn't even talk about the Kentucky games on the road, too, and that's never a, an easy game for Georgia. Uh, they got to go, uh, you know, up to Lexington. But the schedule is definitely a lot more tougher this year. And if Georgia does, you know, advance to the playoffs, win 10-plus games, they will have definitely earned it. Yeah, no doubt no doubt about that. So uh, it's funny we were talking about Saban, but the Bulldogs have not lost to a team, to a non-Saban coach team since 2020, Florida. Yeah. Wow, that's 46 straight wins if you exclude the two losses in that time against Alabama. So that's pretty wild. Against Clemson, they've won two in a row, lost in 2013. But overall, they've won seven of eight. Um, there's only two teams that have beat Clemson 40 times all time. One, South Carolina, who Clemson uh, has beat 73 times. So Clemson's really got their number. Mm-hmm. But the other is Georgia, and the Bulldogs are 43, 18, and four. Really the only team that has Clemson's number in a significant way. Excluding ties, that's about a 70% win percentage for Georgia or 30% for Clemson, uh, depending on how you're looking at it. Do you believe Clemson – or excuse me, do you believe Georgia has a better or worse than 70% chance to win this game? Uh, your listeners probably going to hate me for this. I think they've got a better than 70% chance to win this game. Now, the only reason I say that, I think just, just the, the talent across the board. I mean, I think Clemson has, has done a – a good job from last year this year, I think, improving, you know, that talent level a little bit with some of the freshmen they've got coming in. And I think it helps having a returning quarterback. That's going to, I think, make a, a bigger difference than it would have, uh, you know, a season ago. But, you know, Georgia is pretty they've, – they've, they've got a lot of pluses on both sides of the football right now. And playing in Atlanta at the Benz, you know, it's a place where they, they know, where, know how to play there. They're comfortable playing there. And I think that's going to have a little, you know, have a positive effect. Again, but, you, again – that's why they play the games. You never know what's going to ultimately happen, but I think Georgia has a pretty good chance of winning this if, if they don't make mistakes and play like this capable of. Yeah, it's funny. I, uh, you know, generally you ask that question, pick a winner, 50, 50 you know, just pick your winner. Yeah. But I, I've now asked you and, and one other person, uh, also a Georgia guy, and they both said, eh, maybe 75%. So there's a lot of confidence coming from Georgia. There's definitely a lot of uh, interest. I think if Clemson can go out there, 
even if they lose 28, 20, uh, the 35, 28, something like that, but the offense looks competent, it's close, that could be encouraging for what they do in the ACC. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, the, depending on – it's not just a win or loss. I, I'm very interested to see how the teams look. Uh, yeah, Anthony, if you're, yeah, I was just saying, if you're if you're Clemson, if you if you lose this ball game, I mean, it, it doesn't mean a thing as far as uh, what you're able to do the, the rest of the season. You, you can run the table after that and still make the playoffs. So, so it doesn't probably lose a game and still make the or, playoffs. Yeah, right? yeah, um, yeah. And if you win the AC, the funniest thing would be if Clemson goes ten and two, wins the ACC and gets uh, three or four seed, and Georgia, uh, you know, goes maybe say eleven know. and two, and they're the five or the six. <laughs> things have happened. Yep. Hey, I really appreciate you doing this. Sure, Ryan. If you enjoyed this video, please help this channel by liking the video, subscribing, and leaving a comment. Also, if you're a pet owner and you live in the upstate, check out our sponsor, ReadyVets. They offer immediate walk and care when your pet can't wait. They're open seven days a week till 10 p.m. They're owned by two Clemson grads. They're located in Taylor's, just 10 miles from the Woodridge Road Shopping District.